won't work it Don't make the rest, you won't make it I don't even care Where this world leads All I know is When my heart is gone Live the tree Jim Murphy Masters, my brother from another mother. How you doing? Can you hear me? I'm good. Can you hear me loud and clear? Loud Can you hear me? You're coming through. Okay. One second. I need to get my headphones. One second. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. We got the two chocolate newbie and soul brothers about to go head to head talking about the new pandemic. <laughs> World War Three is just around the corner. Maybe. Well, we'll have to speak to Jamithi to find out. Right. My oh, man. Oh, let me tell you something, brother. Just a heads up. We're streaming. I want to keep this live. And oh, you actually live? Oh, not live. Not live. We're just rolling. Oh. I, I want to keep this. Uh, I'm not going to edit this, but it's all good, man. You're not going to edit it? Better. Are you kidding me? Bro. No, we're not like to jumping out the... Formalized what? and proper. I've, I try to just keep things rolling. Go with the muse. That's how I like to roll. Wow. You're a killer. Like that. It's dangerous, man. You know? For all I know, you may have... Come into your, uh, come into the the living room, man. Without any. I am so. Uh, I, listen, I'm so. I'm so glad one of my babies could have walked in, basically, with the usual. You, oh no, this isn't going live, is it? No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Anyway, <laughs> bro. So what has been happening with you? I know you've been you've been going out a bit more, partying, your life party amongst bro. this craziness, right? Oh, by the way. I, I want to put this up on YouTube because because we're going to be focusing on the war. This is one topic we can talk about without it being okay. censored. So we'll try to keep it somewhat uh, YouTube friendly, right? Yeah, sure. But uh, we'll we'll see how we go. But yeah, what what has been happening with you, man? Well, to be fair, I've been in research mode, basically. So <clears throat> I've been <laughs> I've been doing a lot of research for a documentary that I am working on about the new world orders plans to destroy relationship and <laughs> it, it came about as a result of many different podcasts sort of emerging in the states relationship ones but you know mm. uh, and basically uh, certain individuals kevin samuels uh, fresh and fit the guys like that and so i started looking into it you see, the thing is, the end game for me is, well, they want to depopulate us and they want to, you know, have us transhumaned into something else. Okay. So if that's the case, then, so, so I'm, I'm basically reverse engineering. So, well, if that's the case, is there anything in society, even in our private lives, our relationships with people that um, are, if you like, a direct result of these plans? And then when I looked at relationships and the fact that basically they're literally uh, non-existent, they have broken down men and women on separate uh, rails going the opposite direction, right? Even our view of each other is absolutely not conducive with family or relationships. Um, well, the, the only answer to that question was yes. Everything about our lives has been orchestrated and designed in terms of our relationship in, in that vein. And I didn't even have to look far. I only had to look at existing um, uh, podcasts and then go out into the field myself and start talking with men and women. And my God. <laughs> it has changed so much, Amufi. I mean, yeah. I'm regularly on Tinder and you often see on these dating apps whether women want to have a family. And uh, whereas I know a few generations ago, that was pretty much just the norm. Pretty much every woman. Oh, was, it was the default position. <laughs> Absolutely. They actually, I think I either watched this on something you shared at someone else's, but they did a review of, uh, of a bunch of kids growing up a few generations ago and uh, what happened to them once they, they left college, left high school, something like that. And basically every single one of them had been married. 
and then they kind of juxtapose that to the current uh, society and the vast majority of people after leaving high school, you know, a few years later, they don't get married. They don't want to start this uh, 3.5 family. You know, they, they want to do their own thing. And look, the times change, but I guess the question is how much of that is orchestrated? But before I let you answer that, man, let me just give you a quick introduction for those that are not familiar with Jamuthi Masters. This guy is a DJ. He's a producer. He is the host of Planned Illusion, a podcast focusing on conspiracies, unveiling the reality, unveiling this Maya, this illusionary world that we've been swept up under behind all of this propaganda, behind the mainstream, which, well, if you're watching or listening to this, um, chances are you, you know that you're not getting anywhere near anything like uh, that, that resembles the truth um, from the mainstream media. But in any event, um, Jamufi does a number of things. He's a busy man, but he has been focusing his attention because he's passionate about the world. He is a, he's a, a God-fearing man and wants to do what he can to empower people and pull the wool, not over people's eyes, but um, like the mainstream media is doing, but essentially try to uh, illuminate people's minds with, uh, with wisdom. Jamufi... Uh, before I get into this, I want to let people know that uh, this is the Crucial Journey Podcast. If you want to get a hold of me, you know the drill. You can check us out on the Patreon. I'm on iTunes, Spotify. I'm everywhere. Um, yeah, and we'll put down the details for Jamithi until uh, until that. Uh, but let's let's get into it. All right. So Jamithi, as I was saying, bro, things are pretty crazy right now, and uh, you mentioned that you're working on a a documentary series that focuses on the the relationships in this in this current uh, paradigm, like what's going on, right? Have you right. what have you learned so far from uh, from your research into this? <sighs> to be fair, the result <laughs> the results are really sad because I realise now that um, <clears throat> uh, well, e essentially we're heading to what I call an extinction level event. And this was even before you add in war and, you know, fake pandemics, okay? Um, so we understand that there is an, an, an external attack by way of uh, GMO foods, pollution of water, whatever else. And also, you know, embedded in that, you've got changes in the food system to our hormones. So men and women hormonally are off track anyway. But then when you then look at the, the generational attacks on humanity, the attacks that pretty much have changed human relationships that pretty much, if you like, sustained humanity for thousands of years. So, so you know, from one region or, or another, you had basic um, understanding of uh, marriage and family, whatever else such that it would sustain um, the growth of a family through, through generations and whatever yours. And, and then rules that surrounded the behavior of men and women, if you like. Well, okay. suddenly that came to an abrupt halt, um, I would say in the 50s and 60s, when, when you know, of course, you, well, I, I call it the, the um, weaponization of relationships, weaponization of women. On, on, on the one hand, uh, whereby the need to want um, women to have more choices, uh, freedom of choice and, and equality and the ability to do whatever they want in life, that was weaponized and, if you like, was used to change the, if you like, the, 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 the equilibrium in favour of women. So if, if you can argue that women maybe didn't have the rights they, 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 they should have done before then, well, what's actually happened now 2022? The floodgates have been opened so much that women have so much choice, freedom, whatever else, that they're actually in self-destruct mode and their appetite for wanting to be wives and mothers has, if you, if you like, um, been developed to such a point where it's basically non-existent. 
So then if you extrapolate that to say 2030, 2040, well, uh, if, 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 if women are less, um, if women are less in favor of family, less in favor of having children, then quite frankly, the, the human race, it will cease to exist. Well, let me challenge you right there, okay, sure. because where is, I think what you're saying is true, I think it's self-evident that you have a look at just the population growth and the amount of, definitely in the Western world, the amount of, of women having children, it's definitely reduced, right? But as we're moving into an age now where we have genetically engineered uh, mosquitoes and we have uh, uh, gene-altering um, you know, juice, boom shakalakas as I call it, there's also the application now to... Uh, essentially have these uh what do you call call them like um uh babies that are essentially born in a in a lab these lab babies right so the whole i, I think through in vitro fertilization and all these avenues do you think it's a possibility that we'll be seeing uh, a growth of, of 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 humanity but just not through the conventional ways i mean they're essentially having kids grown in labs now through these um through these experiments and whatnot. I mean, doesn't it seem plausible that they'll find another approach to sustaining the human race without this conventional um, uh, approach? You know, it's, it's a very good question. And it was, a, it was a topic that was posed by one of my guests, uh, Craig Campbell from um, Canada, and who, who pointed out that um, you're going to have uh, sort of fetuses grown externally. And I think he's... <laughs> He called it. He said that there'll come a point where uh, you'll have this hanging naan bread, which is a fetus. You, 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 you and your partner will be able to watch your fetus grow. Because yeah. what he was saying was that um, social engineers have realized that um, a childbirth is unfair on women, basically, because they have time to pay. That okay. would be, and that's not a hard sell. I mean, look, practically speaking, I mean, you only have to look at 100 years past, right? And you, the, the percentage of women that would, would die during childbirth. And granted, it's a rarity now. It happens a lot, but it's incredibly strenuous. There are some, I, I know some women personally that have had uh, a, an absolute ordeal having giving birth to the point where it's it's almost killed them you know they have they they suffer from some some kind of rare uh problem when it comes to child for having children so it wouldn't be that stretch for a society to or the media to put this idea that look it's it's not fair in women in fact you see this been pushed right now that men should get a vasectomy because it's not fair to put this pressure on on women and uh, to have them fall pregnant and so forth so the, the moral thing for a man to do, this is what I see perpetuated now, is to get a vasectomy. So I can very much see in the future, the push is going to be to get women to, uh, to, to not have these natural births and to default to having this stuff grown in some lab. I can see well, I mean, that, it, like that's already happening. I'm sure we're just not hearing about it. Well, well absolutely right. So, so obviously then the science is there essentially to do this okay mm -hmm. but but let's look at these social attitudes and, and the social conditioning so you've got a situation now where basically women that are thinking that it, it, it's not um in their benefit at all it doesn't benefit them to become um wives so that's that mm -hmm. um well you know it benefits them to stay out in the in the workforce you know and you know become these strong independent business women these entrepreneurs basically right and therefore, delay childbirth or not not even look at childbirth. Um, this notion that basically men men are very dangerous to women. Basically, if you go into a relationship with a man, you're likely to be killed. Essentially, um, or, or or certainly your man is likely to cheat. So all these things essentially have put this um, has has garnered a cultivated an appetite against that. Now, if you look at each one of those. Each one of these those those uh, those factors are all fake, absolutely fake. The figures show that in terms of um, who's cheating. Well, I mean, <laughs> there are those who know, quite frankly, that women are cheating in relationships far more than men. Why? Because they have more access to cheat, or they have more access to sex than men do. This notion, for example, that men are having more more uh, rampant sex, well, this is simply not true. Folks, hit newsflash for you, all right? Number of men who are actively have, engaging in sex these days, 
of men in the Western world are not engaging in sex. But some of them haven't even had uh, dates for, 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 for whatever. Now, flip the coin, the percentage of women who are having sex, over 70%. Now, so how, how's that correlating? Well, because through social media and Instagram, a woman will have X times X times X number of requests from men and she will only go for the top 20 10 or even 5% of those requests in other words up to 95% of the men who hit on her will be invisible and with all due respect if they don't look like Chris or me they really haven't got a chance <laughs> <laughs> No, look, I, I definitely will test side the fact that men have it so much harder. I, you only have to look at the, the Tinder accounts of your, of your girlfriends and to find that they're just getting inundated with matches, match, match, match. Where, and look, they've done so many tests on this. Where is, and here's the thing. The, the top, I think I mentioned this in your last podcast. Maybe I mentioned this in conversation. The most uh, matched guy of 2018 uh, was this guy. And I had to look at the amount of matches he was getting. I think he was getting like six or seven a day. I mean, a, an average girl will get more than that. And this is the top match guy of 2018. I remember reading this profile. It was give, looking to see what I can find, I, I, what tips I could find. Dude, dude, dude my show? sister, my, my, my si- one of my sisters, we, we did this, we, fantastic. She knew um, if, uh, a few weeks back that I was doing this experiment, basically. And, you know, she said, oh, she said to me, well, why don't you jump on the dating apps? I thought, wow. Okay. So that's when I spoke to you. I thought, okay, that's a good idea. Anyway, so she's... She, she said, oh, I'm on a dating app. So I contact, contacted her a week later. This is a woman who's in her 50s. Contacted her a week later. And you know the nut where it says the number of matches? Mm. It had got 99 plus. Yeah. The number of people that were hitting on her. And what, yeah. you know what was really funny? Mm. I said to her, so, wow, said, geez, you're getting, you're getting some hits there. And I said, so what are they like? She goes, come on, bruv. I haven't got time to go through, through them all. <laughs> and look, oh, of course she would. So that proves my point. Oh, 100%. The rest of them yeah. would still be invisible to her. Yeah, and so I've she done was tests. picking the cream of the crop. She was <laughs> absolutely. I've done tests, by the way, where I've just, uh, I, I've just, I've one, I've pretended to be some attractive girl and I've gone <laughs> on and just the, it's unbelievable. Where is it'll take like a day, you know, before I, I get a few matches as a, as a typical guy, you know, going for women. As a, as a woman, it's just within a few seconds, you're just inundated. That's why it's so competitive. And what's even funny is that when you're, uh, when you're, even when you make a profile as a guy and you set it to, to guys, you just, I've done this by accident before. You know, I don't swing that, that way, all right? But I've, I've opened it up for guys and girls. It's unbelievable. It's like guys are so thirsty. It's ridiculous. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Well, I mean, it's basically because because only a small so think about it. Yeah. So it, because only a small percentage of the men are getting picked, and, and naturally so. If you've got choice, mm. right? If a woman has choice, my gosh, she's not going to go for bottom to mid. She's exactly. going to go. She's not even going to go for mid. She's going to go for the top end, and you know, you know, hedge hedge her bets. Which means, therefore, then a small number of guys. And get in the lion's share of the girls. Absolutely. Bro. This, is, this, this is what's going on. But I'll tell you what, it's been like that. I mean, not as great to an effect as it's happening now, obviously, but women have always been the ones that choose, in my opinion, generally speaking. I mean, they're, they're typically, I would imagine, the, the sex that gets the pick of the litter. That's what I, I mean. I, it, 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 to be honest with you, in fairness, um, <clears throat> When you look at traditional relationships, that wasn't true. That wasn't true. It's only been that way since the, uh, I would say, the manipulation of our societies through these groups. That sure. Essentially I mean, the kings, them. obviously, people of uh, aristocracy who would have their pick of the litter. They could, you know, for instance, a king could uh, have sex with as many people oh, for, as he wanted sure. to, right? But typically speaking, um, I, I, maybe it, Maybe it's a cultural thing, but I've, I've always thought of the woman as um, being the, like, even in the Renaissance era, there's this attitude of the man needing to, uh, to win the woman over. It's like, a ch- it's basically a contest in which to win her over. Whereas, um, 
it, it, there doesn't seem to be that emphasis on the woman needing to win the man over. It's kind of like the woman is deemed up as being a prize. Therefore, it's been, it's been more of like a competition in order to win the fair. Well, I mean, and, there, and, and what I found, <clears throat> and I, there's a lot of my content <laughs> that's going to be very, very controversial, factually controversial, because okay. when you look at everything that you've said there and the fact that, yes, women, women have got choice, it's actually become detriment to them because here's the thing. Okay, so women, you know, as I say, yes, they are going for the 5% of the guys. But so that, that also means, therefore, then that um, they're picking men who basically uh, have got the run of, they've got the run of the litter, basically, and uh, men who, you know, they can afford to treat them bad and whatever else. Mm -hmm. so, so their perception of the world of men is restricted and limited to just this five to ten percent of men. The rest of the average men who are who are actually, you know, um, we're very simplistic creatures, really. Um, do you like me? Can you cook? Great, let's get it on, sort of thing. Whereas that in that five to ten percent, oh, of course, I mean they're they're looking for the the models, uh, the the younger the better, and so on and so forth. Where where these where these women. You know, they've got uh, absolutely no reason to want to be that, that stereotypical wives and mothers. Why? Because they've got X amount of number of men hitting on them. And by the way, you know, they want money, whatever else, this, that and the other. So in actual fact, the end result is this. You've got women with high body counts. OK. All right. Um, then leaving it to sort of. It, becoming mothers before becoming wives, leaving or leaving marriage till sort of 40, then realizing because, look, you know, a woman's body, unless, unless they, you know, keep it up to date, unless they keep, keep fit, keep well, whatever else, it declines pretty rapidly. I mean, you know, us guys here who are in our 70s, I mean, we, we, we do all right. Okay. Yeah. But, oh, that's, a, that's a medical fact, though. I'm, obviously, it's, it's, women, their child, raising uh years you know they're, they're but but, but, really, but uh, exactly and i think in in that in that for that reason traditionally you basically a, a woman's goal in life was to become a suitable wife for the right guy a, 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 a husband who would look after her and basically secure her future now because women are leaving it to 40, 50, whatever else, in some cases, um, they're just simply not finding suitors. They're not. And, you know, at that age as well, um, the, by the time they've got to 40, they have absolutely no inclination of becoming someone's wife. I mean, I, I, I did an experiment on, on one of my nieces yesterday because she was asking me about this. She'd heard that this is, I was doing this documentary and, and she said to me, so uh, I'm, what, what, would you, what would you suggest? I mean, how would you go about looking for someone? And I said, to be honest, that used to be a really complicated question, but I have one question that I can ask a woman that will tell me whether she's suitable and it would, wouldn't matter what her age group or whatever. And it's simply this, why would you want to be, why would you want to get married? that her answer will tell me everything mm. in but short she says something about family children well well well, well it, 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 put, let's put it this way put it this way right 9.9 .9, uh, women out of 10 mm -hmm. are going to say everything and guess which answer they'll leave out or it will be at the bottom of the list hmm. they want to provide for a man <laughs> <laughs> oh, right really? there yeah because i cannot think of I, I, I that actually, right there yeah you know what I, I i let a good one slip by i actually dated a girl one time that told me that she just wanted to like be able to have a guy and cook for for him and and make sure that he's looked after and uh, I let that one slip through the cracks, you know, but that is a rarity. Go, 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 go after her. Go find, I'll go find her. thing though, the kind of um, uh, contrast what's going on here in the West, right? Vice actually, I think it was Vice. They did a documentary on a country that had essentially, it, it's, it's, it's the easiest place to become an eligible bachelor. 
I bet you won't be able to guess what country this was. This is a few years ago, mind you, about four or five years ago. But and the thing is, the the women are whoa, they're ridiculous, man. Are, are, they, are, they, are they literally? Are they, are they shocking? Are they? No, well, well, they're, they're beautiful. They're ridiculous. Oh, they're beautiful. Are, yeah. Really? Yeah. Listen, I'll be booking my travel. Like, uh, well, the, I would be too, but I'll tell you what, it it would be a difficult. Different oh, decision given course. everything that's going on right now, right? Because you'd never oh, pick what yeah. country you want to know what country it is. No, Ukraine. Oh, <laughs> I kid you not. I kid you not. One was the 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 contract, the, the amount of women compared to men. Like there's so many women and so few men in this country. This is this is from what, what the documentary was. You know something that would explain and, why yeah, one of my ex girlfriends who was Ukrainian was such a lovely girl. She was fantastic. Absolutely, and they all want a foreigner, right? That's the other thing. In fact, a lot of the times they're, they're trying to get these green cards to go overseas so they can marry a you know, a, a wealthy American or something like that. And then of course they're, you know, wow. Slavic women, these, these women of the Balkans, they're, they're ridiculously attractive. Oh, listen, dude, on. dude, I mean, dude, honestly, I, I, I dated yeah. a woman from the Czech Republic. So it's like, may, I have a conspiracy theory. I think the reason that Putin is invading Ukraine is he wants all this hot Ukrainian, he wants, he wants to expand and have more beautiful Ukrainian women, you know, and offer oh, these the Russian women. Ukrainian the the, 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 the Russian run. women, the it's Russian women aren't too bad themselves. They're not slouching. My day. I know. I mean, they're more or less. Um, yes. I, I mean, they're indistinguishable to me. You know, I'm I'm just being silly. That's the weird thing, right? About about this war that's happened time and time again in many different cultures. There's no real distinction between these people. This is from an outsider, at least from the physical characteristic. Like, I, we can't tell the difference. It's like. It's like the uh, the Hutsi versus the the the, tu- the Tutus or something like you know like in um, in South Africa how you have these different tribes that were warring but essentially they That's were right. the and it's same. versus the Hutus. So physiologically they're essentially the same people, right? But culturally, I guess it's I I actually had residency at a Russian uh, restaurant for a number of years and the vast majority of people they were Ukrainian. I remember asking these people what the difference is between Ukrainian and Russian culture. And, you know, the, the differences were so subtle that I, I re- nothing really stuck out. But nonetheless, but of course, you and I know that it has nothing to do with the, the real reason for this war has very little to do with the, the reason that's been put forth by the mainstream narrative, which we which I'd love to get into a little because the narrative, at least the last time I checked, is that Russia is invading the Ukraine because uh, apparently, Ukraine was was considering becoming a member of NATO, and if uh, that happened, then NATO would have its forces patrolling the border, and then that would be uh, a threat to the security of Russia. And there's a lot of history. Uh, there's a lot more to this than that, but essentially, Putin has, at least I believe, I've heard him say that he's concerned about the security of Russia and uh, Ukraine. Is, the fact that Ukraine is also dominated by these uh, these Nazis and so forth. This was cause for him needing to uh, to go in there. At least that's the narrative that I've been hearing. Now, I guess what makes this thing so incredibly concerning is that this is not some little country. This is not some country in Africa where uh, these people don't have access to nuclear weapons. We're dealing with, not arguably, like the biggest nuclear superpower in the world. They have enough nukes to blow the world up many, many times fold. And Russia is not they're, I mean, they're, they're definitely not a force to be taken lightly. So worries in the United States, the United States has a reputation of bullying countries, right? And uh, they're not really concerned about invading these countries because they don't have nuclear weapons. But you'll notice that when a country has nuclear weapons, they treat them very differently. And they try to tell them, look, you got to get rid of nuclear weapons, but they do it peacefully. And then as soon as that, as soon as that country gives up its nuclear weapons, then the United States is bombs the crap out of them. This has been the history, all right? But when you're dealing with a country, this is why most of these countries want to get nuclear weapons like Iran, right? Because they know that when you're a country like Russia and you have nukes or North Korea, even though it's not that militarily sophisticated, but because they have access to these weapons, the United States respects you. But we're dealing with a country here that has these weapons and they've openly said that they're considering using these weapons. The American politicians have been playing this Id- this game of, well, you know, it might be necessary for us to, uh, to, uh, to, yeah, to actually go to war with, like, they, last I heard, I mean, granted this was retracted, but uh, the United States government was considering um, allowing Poland to transport its MiG-29s to the United States and then to Ukraine. And that's just Jeez. a stone's throw away from actively arming a country that is at war with another country. That's justification for 
for for that for Russia attacking the United States, you know. But I think they they decline. So anyway, that's my assessment of what's going on between Russia and Ukraine. I'd love to hear your assessment. Yeah, look, no, I think the historical background is is pretty well known. I mean, on the one hand, you've got NATO sort of um, encroaching upon you know the Russian borders, basically acquiring country after country, countries that used to be part of the Soviet uh, Union, <laughs> in, in, you know, the old Soviet Union, certainly uh, suddenly becoming absorbed by NATO. And then on the flip side of that, you've had um, you know the. The, the Russians then basically, in 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 a bit to defend their territory, set up the uh, the Warsaw Pact, which was I think it was half a dozen countries right on the border of uh, sort of west eastern east to western uh, Europe on that border there, you know, to try and you know defend themselves and that, um, and then basically so you, you had this on pass and then. You know, uh, the Russians basically were saying, "Look, you know, we'll come to a treaty on this. We'll 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 disband the the, the Warsaw Pact, basically." And then on the other side, of course, is to say, um, the US right through NATO, fully aware that the Russians do have nuclear capabilities, sort of said, "Look, if you disband your <clears throat> your nuclear capabilities, whatever else." Then we're good to go. Now both sides basically lied um, or, or reneged on their promises. NATO just grew bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes, um, the Russians disbanded the Warsaw Pact, but they certainly increased their <laughs> nuclear capabilities. Now, so what, what, what was the end game here? Well, the timing of this and the fact that both pl- sides, both players, during the height of the pandemic were very much complicit and participa- uh, partic- complicit participants in getting their their um, uh, the, their their uh, uh, the people within their country jabbed. So that tells you what. Oh, they're obviously part of that agenda. So what we're seeing now, w- we came to a point where you had the you had the ca- Canadian truckers. Uh, uh, protests. You had the protests in Australia, and then, and then it was the, the 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 Brits back home in the UK. You know they were looking to ramp up the uh, you know the vaccine passports, and then suddenly, all quiet. Or certainly, you know they were in terms of uh, vaccine mandates. Things were beginning to. There was a pullback, as we call it on my channel, all right? And I always said to everyone, guys, the end game. As you well know, Chris, was always to take away our rights and civil liberties by way of um, in a state of emergency, whether it be state of emergencies, pandemic, exactly, well, exactly, whether it's a pandemic, whether whether it's a freak weather conditions or war or climate change, that's coming. That, that's right. Okay, so so you look at the situation in Ukraine and the timing, and you've got to see it as the extension of because as I was saying to someone. As I was saying to someone literally just like, like an hour or so ago, you know, this war has caused a conflict tactically in an area of Europe such that, you know, with the players that are jostling for positions on either side, you could see, um, you know, trade embargoes. Well, we're seeing it now already. Um, you, you, you know, disruptions to food distribution, disrupt, disruptions to fuel, the banking system being turned on its head. All these things that were promised by the World Economic Forum anyway. <laughs> All right. OK, um, you've got you've got you've got to you see, we've got to understand that as, as far as the Russian, you, you, the, the Ukraine Russian conflict, there are external parties on both sides who are owned by New World Order conglomerates, sure. okay, who, who, who had subscribed to this removal of human rights via 20, Agenda 2021, Agenda 2030, and, and so on and so forth. And so this, to me, um, you know, by way of different, you know, weaponry, by way of, uh, you know, um, assaults on our very living, our being. Mm. Because as, as 
but whatever sorts not being is a way of doing that. Okay. Because as, as it was stated in a conversation an hour ago, this war already is seeing men having to go to the front line, basically, to fight. It's seeing more people losing their homes. You know, they'll never get back again. The economy there's been smashed and so on and so forth. These are all things that, they, that were the prerequisites of the Great Reset. Sure. But Januthi, don't you think it's a bit of an assumption to, to say just because certain factions are on the same page with, let's say, vaccine mandates, that they're going to be on the same page with everything else? I mean, you have a look at, let's say, leftists, right? Like, or well, let's use the black community. Let's generally the democratic black community. Like most of them are for reparations because of things that happened uh, hundreds of years ago. We don't need to get into that, right? However, they have disagreements in other areas. Like there are some leftists that are, uh, uh, when it comes to uh, when it's abortion, you know, they're they're pro-abortion or they're they're anti-abortion, so forth. You know, like the point I'm trying to make is that where is you see a, a group of people being on the same page with one issue doesn't mean they're necessarily, wouldn't you agree, going to be on the same page? And I hear what they're saying, that, that these people obviously, on a hierarchical structure, these these sides are funded by the same organization. But when it comes to perhaps other issues, because let's face it, just like, uh, um, like with Ukraine and, and Russia, they have a lot of things in common, right? But clearly there are certain things that they don't have in common. And looking at this, I guess, on a more nuanced level, wouldn't it make sense to presume that um, Russia, even though they're on the same page, when it comes to the mandates and so forth, their government is going to have disagreements with other countries when it comes to other issues. Therefore, I, where is I? I mean, look, I'm on the same page as you when it comes to the fact that this is where these people are playing under, like the, they're they're essentially beholden to the same interest groups. But I think it would be it would be um, it would be an assumption to presume that this just because of that, there's always going to be. Um, a, a, a planned agenda anytime something is going on. Like, I think it's quite possible that Putin perhaps truly does not have uh, the same, like he openly said this in an interview he did, um, I think it was last week, and I actually believed him. He was talking about the, the issue that he has with the United States, right? The fact that the, the one thing he wants is predictability. This is for Russia. This is for the world in large. And the fact that he's seen just over the last um, few years, like there's been this unpredictability in what's been going on in the United States. And that's made him very uncomfortable, particularly in regards to the sovereignty of Russia. That's why he is doing what he's doing. Because, like, I understood this by, well, he actually said this, the fact that the United States makes certain promises and then someone else gets in power. Like, he made a good point. Yeah, they could make an agreement with the United States, right? Like with Joe Biden, but then someone else gets in power and wants to renege on that. And this is a problem you have with kingdoms, with governments. And because he's uncomfortable with, um, with the insecurity of what's going on, this is his justification for what he's doing. And like, no doubt, these people are on, under the same, like, same system of governance when it comes to these, uh, these big power players. But I think, don't, do you think that there are going to be other issues that they don't see eye to eye on? Or do you think at the end of the day, this is all part of a, what's that word you like to use, controlled opposition? And fundamentally, these people are playing the same game. I think ultimately these people are playing the same game, whether they're actually conscious of it or whether they're actually uh, directly involved in that game. That's another thing. Well, because yeah, I'll tell you something. That's a big thing, though. Like to be a, yeah, because there's a big distinction between that. Because correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying that um, even though they're not aware of what's going on, fundamentally they're being played and they end up behaving in a way where they're doing what has been orchestrated by the powers to be, which is very different for them actually. Um, like conspiracizing in order to to bring about something, right? Right. So, yeah. so here's the thing. You know, I mean, it, it's no surprise now that you've got the uh, you, Klaus Schwab basically had solicited what were the global young leaders. So, for example, um, we know that, that several of our guys, Boris Johnson, um, you know, the, the the witch over there in in New Zealand. Um, mm. Jacinda Ardern. Yeah, uh, uh, oh, and um, oh, oh, that's right. President Zelensky as well, tied to Klaus Schwab. Just a coincidence. Okay. So, so here's the thing. You see, on this level, we, it, we're too busy with what? Working, 
to get money for our daily sus sustenance. You see, as long as you've got that, several layers up, whereby basically money is no object to these people, you know, they don't really care. As long as they keep you busy, they know that you will have to ride whatever, the, whatever wave you're on. They know that the wind, that they, when they blow, you will have to move in the opposite direction, okay? You, sorry, you'll have to move a, a, a against the wind. If The wind will blow you in whatever direction they want you to go. It's as simple as that. Now, with regards to the divisions and that, you're right. Yes, of course, you've got different groups. By the way, groups that they created, okay? They created these groups um, that will fight it out to help with a certain narrative. But Chris and everyone is listening. Remember this, you know, during the height of the, of the pandemic and the vaccine rollout, they managed to orchestrate the, the separation of members, people in, in the same family, just by way of whether they took the jab or not. Now, you see, a brilliant, brilliant, deep level, advanced psychological warfare. That's all it took to do that. So if they can do that within our own homes, in our own families, and we're all, we've all become, you know, victims of that in some way, shape or form, okay? Trust you, me, they can do that on a global level. Um, yeah. You know, using the pieces, i.e. I, the different groups, social groups, or, you know, Black Lives Matter, or y Ukraine. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Okay, so... Just before you get into that, I just want to make the point that being able to do that, I, just, to, just to note, I don't think it's that hard to do, because there are always, anytime you have an issue as big as this, there are always going to be people that are not on board, like with the whole vaccine right. thing, right? So all you have to do is just create uh, enough evidence you know to the mainstream the, the the normies would would believe you know in order for them to just believe it was just justified to bring about these mandates and then of course you're going to have some people that were never going to agree with the mandates regardless and like the idea of orchestrating the division i whereas i think that's happened but i think it's just been by virtue of the fact that it's going to anytime you have uh you have something that is so a, a, such a polarizing issue there's always going to be this division yeah, it's, but you've got to remember as well that, yeah. that they, they can carefully uh, cultivate your perception of reality and my perception of reality using the media. Sure. So, for example, you've got two friends of mine who, during the height of the, you know, uh, pandemic, mm -hmm. both of them called Elena. You, you're going to love this. Both of them called it Elena. One is from the Ukraine. One is Russian. They used to come to my house. We used to discuss, you know. Yeah, you know, how are we going to, you know, navigate through the mandates? Would you believe it, since the start of the Ukraine-Russian uh, conflict, they're now arch enemies? Yeah. Okay. Of course so, I believe that, yeah. Right. So, so th this is the nature. And, of course, media has fueled that. Mm. So, remember, all these are just weapons to, to ensure that they can steer but the landscape. Think, as a sign-up, wouldn't it be... In the interest of the media and these higher powers, so to, so to speak, wouldn't it be their interest to get as many people on board as possible with the narrative? Like the last thing you want, in fact, it, there was definitely this going on. The last thing you want is factions of people bringing about resistance. The more they, what they wanted more so than anything was to have as many people as they could on board with the narrative, because the more anti-waxers you have that are not in line with the narrative, the more problems you have. So I, the way I see it, it's like there's this massive push to get everyone in this together. That's what they're saying. We're all in this together. There is no division. You and your anti-waxer mentalities, you guys not wanting to go on board with the program. No, 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 no. We got to get everyone doing this. We're in this together. This is the rhetoric you see from all these leaders. Because this, this is psychology once again. You create a narrative where basically everyone is doing this. This is, this is just sales psychology. You don't want to create a narrative that, look, there aren't that many people doing this. As a result, I think, um, I mean, granted, they were trying to get everyone to do this. I, I think, granted, it was going to be inevitable. There were some, some people that did not want to go ahead with this. The general push would have been, we need to get as many people on board with this, rather than trying to get 50-50%. Because what you most certainly don't want is a situation where a vast majority of people are opposed, I would think anyway, are opposed to what is going on. 
because that's going to create more war. You want a seamless transition. You want every, you want a small minority, like one, 2% of people, the anti-waxers. What you don't want is 50%, which is where I think it is now, because that's what's creating the problem. Well, I mean, the, <laughs> I know you mentioned narrative there. What, yeah. what do you think the narrative is? Well, the narrative is to get as many people going ahead with these men. It's going ahead with the agenda and being, be, being, uh, being asleep, what you and I would call asleep, as possible, rather than create a situation where there is resistance and war, because that creates problems for, well, everyone that is trying to bring about this, uh, this narrative of like mandatory boom shakalakas. Okay, so what happens if the narrative then is just, we want to depopulate the earth? Well, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can delve into that. Um, with, well, okay, so, well, it, all right, okay. Remember, so remember, so remember, there's eight, 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 eight billion. All right. And you've right, got eight billion people, and you want to depopulate the earth. Okay. You see, you, no, you, fair, what, sure what, enough. What, well, that's, okay, I, now I'm on the same, sure, but I, I hear what you're saying. So essentially, if you create more dissent, more, um, more issues, then you'd have exactly. the virus. However, where is that somewhat plausible? I think it's just based off of what I'm seeing from the media, like, the, the reception that I've had is they tried to make anyone that seems to have won the narratives being like, that's, that's ridiculous. That's impossible. It hasn't been, it, it's, it's been such a ridicule and it's been done in order to get as many, to make it seem so fringe for anyone to challenge this thing. Cause the general push has to be, been to get everyone as in this. And the issue I think that they've come across is they weren't expecting there to be so much resistance. Because the numbers, the, the, this is why they're always trying to hide the amount of people that are at these protests. Like you have a look at what was going on in, in uh, Canberra. And I've heard there were millions of people there. And the media was obviously trying to present this narrative that there's basically no one there. Why? Because they want everyone to see, think that everyone is in this together because that only forwards the narrative. However, if you create this narrative, if the media was like, well, you know, we have about 50% of the uh, anti-wax community not on board with this, you know, so they, they have, no, they don't try to, uh, substantiate their arguments because that's the last thing you want because that would actually seem like a debate what you do is you ridicule the position of the other side and you make it seem as if their position is completely untenable and that way you can further your agenda like the last thing i think the the narrative you know the people in power want this is definitely from a political level is to create a narrative that oh this is like a 50 50 this is what people do in argumentation oh that's a completely ridiculous idea what you believe in aliens you believe in uh, you set up come on man that's ridiculous it's not like yeah there are a lot of people that believe that but i hear what you're saying it's, it's plausible but i'm just under the opinion that where is that's happened and it serves a purpose i think the general goal was to get as many people on board with this thing as possible that's why the push was for 95 percent. the push was for it, it, look, if you don't get this thing, you're not going to be able to exist in Australia. This is what Daniel Andrews more or less was saying, you know, like life is going to be very difficult. I think, look, for one, um, in the first instance, mm -hmm. even if you look at, um, uh, yes, there is the plausible, but um, the narratives are now working against them. The one thing we also got to bear in mind is that they'll just keep you busy with many narratives. Sure. So, that so now basic. So first we, we've got a pandemic, right? So you, let's just say you've got a sizable population, sizable percentage have been jabbed. Add to that now, those who are against the mainstream media narrative on the Ukrainian war for him. Mm -hmm. And bear oh, in mind, see it happening with the war, by the way, that exactly sense of me, like the division there, like I can right, that fuel right, agent. yeah, right. So, and don't forget now, we've got policies, for example, in Victoria, where where where, where you are, whereby, you know, <clears throat> if you're seen to be anti-establishment, the, the 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 administration has powers now to detain mm -hmm. you, yep, even without a trial. So now we've got. We've got two major areas with which you could be you could be in a precarious situation. You could be seen as, you know, anti-establishment. You could have your rights taken away from you. you. You look at what's happening in Ukraine now with, you know, this, so that's the belly of the beast. They, you know, they're in a war footing. Now, <clears throat> imagine 
in that situation, you've got your rights and liberties, your ability to move from A to B, and, you know, that you've got to fight you, so, uh, as a man, th- th- taken away from you on top of that. Imagine you add to that a pandemic outbreak. And you, you can see now they've got the tool, they've got the tools in the, their arsenal to really cause mayhem, absolute mayhem. And I, what, I, what I want people to understand is that it, it, we, it's not about focusing on just one thing. It's a multi-dimensional, multi-level attack with which confusion, right? Order out of chaos, right? That is the name of the game. They need to create chaos and they'll throw everything into the kitchen sink. Adverse weather conditions, pandemics, you know, war, this is social unrest, this, that, the other, you know, men and, men and women just did not, not at, t- at t- odds with each other, plus many, many more that we haven't even, you know, haven't been, haven't been thought of yet. That's where we are. 100%. It sounds like a playbook from the art of war to, to distract your, your enemy. I think of the, uh, the Thoreau quote, I think it is, you know, there's so many, I see so many people striking at the, the branches of evil, but none at the roots. It's like people are focusing on all of this, uh, uh, this external stuff um, that isn't really at the heart of the problem. Like, oh, really, Ukraine versus Russia? Or um, really, oh, my friend is dying from X and Y. When you really have a look at what's going on, like the heart of it, the erosion of freedoms, um, more control, um, the destruction of the family unit and so forth. Like these are what I would call at the branches. So I, I def and I definitely I think the you, you tend to play on this level that is a very kind of like I, I'd say like psychological you know higher level like in terms of like what is really going on on the higher up which is where this stuff takes effect because you generally don't hear people talking about controlled opposition and these kind of like higher thinking concepts because they are but this is no doubt I mean this is from um you know the the books some some dare call it conspiracy. Th- like it's, uh, I forget, I always forget the title, but there's a- They there. call it a conspiracy or something. Absolutely. Yeah. You realize that these high psyop approaches are actually used that ideas like, oh, a uh, problem reaction solution, like creating a problem and, and then, um, you know, having your, your people come to you for the solution. These are tactics that are used and they sound conspiratorial, but I'll tell you what, the conspiracy theorists are looking pretty damn good at the moment, <laughs> considering we've had so many things right. I mean, I had a look at a, uh, found an article just two years ago where Vice, and it's so weird going back in time, looking at stuff like this, yeah. because Vice posted this idea that there are crazy anti-waxers that believe that the, the what's going to happen is the government is going to force vaccine mandates <laughs> and it's going to use its powers to restrict people. And that's, that's ridiculous. Right? <laughs> that's completely, re- that was two years ago. Right. And it's weird because we, I mean, we, it's, it's like when you look at things, um, like you, you do this, uh, you, you look back and you see what was considered to be extreme, uh, crazy right now. And then back then, and then we're living it now. You go, whoa, just like, a, like this has been happening every year. You know, like we, this has been going, this is why I saw some meme, you know, conspiracy theorists is 16 up. It's not like we're, we're counting, you know, it's not like this is a, a game or anything, you know, but we, we're doing pretty damn well, 16 to zero, because you keep on looking at the things they say are going to happen, right? And they seem extreme. But then you just look back a year later, right? And then they end up being right about it in terms of not just the boom shakalaka, but in terms of specifically what we can talk about are the mandates, the, the plays that are going to be used. The, oh, look, we're not going to make this a vaccine passport, but then it's a vaccine passport. Oh, look, we're not going to restrict you in your, but it all ends up coming into fruition. Then you realize, oh, these guys are one, uh, 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 this is from a playbook. And th- there's a reason why the conspiracy theorists are getting things right. It's not like they're soothsayers. They just, they just read the plans of the agenda. I mean, I got taken off of a stream just recently, right? Because I mentioned the jizz reset, right? And it- it's so weird because this is something that's out in the open, but it's still given this, this uh, oh, it, you know, that's, that's nonsense. There are some people to this day that think it's a conspiracy theory, even though you only have to watch all these politicians openly speak about this Build Back Better program and make reference to the Great Reset. And when, of course, the conspiracy theorists mentioned this, um, before it was kind of more ostensible, uh, it was considered, once again, a conspiracy theory. Indeed. And I think that 
it's a wonder that they the brazenness of them to document their plans, you know, well beforehand. I mean, you know, you, you've got to, for example, people like uh, Aldous Huxley writing uh, books like Brave New World and George Orwell. Now, you suddenly realise that, um, you know, Brave New World, it wasn't a, um, a, 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 a non-fiction or whatever else. It actually was, it was basically a playbook, you know. But I think it was a playbook based on the fact that you could see the instruments... Yeah, well, the, well, he, what he was actually alluding to was that the 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 tools were being created to enable that kind of level of control. So, for example, during the start of the the, the pandemic, you know, in the UK, mm-hmm. you had um, the the UK government had enlisted the services of Sage. That's the um, scientific advisory group, okay? SAGE, uh, and essentially what, <laughs> so did that comprised of uh, um, several um, very unlikely industry lead- leaders, namely Google. Now, what, <laughs> what, what, what would Google know about advising the UK government on a health emergency, all right? But what they were doing was showing or advising the government on how to sell the idea of a pan of the pandemic that the pandemic is real, knowing that of course you see the reality outside of the well, illusion. Wait a second, it, it's obviously real. It's a very very real pandemic. That's why they were selling selling that it was a real pandemic. Well, well the, 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 you see, yeah. fantastic, yeah. fantastic, exactly yeah, right. But you see, but, but you see, you see what they were doing was using military grade psychological warfare and and advising the government on how to utilize that they mm-hmm. even had a subsidiary group of uh, sage called mines believe it or not you know and there's what their job is they're experts in the psychology of the of the group think okay and how to not just understand the psychology but to how to use advanced tools enable to it to enable societal change to change people's thinking. So, for example, you know, in Australia, one of the cool ways, and, and everyone can go back in time and, and, and check this, you, if you were reading a headline during the pandemic, the first thing that you were reading was the number of cases today mm-hmm. in, at, in the midst of X, Y, Z event. The weather was bad today, you know, or 2,150 cases during total rainfall today mm-hmm. or you know what I'm saying? or someone so and so and so um was found guilty of whatever else on the day when we registered 850 cases so sure. you were being given this psychological manipulation the general public were every single day not to mention the you know the, the daily cases count and, and you and i know they, they, they might as well have been talking about cases of beer, basically, because the number of cases actually had no relation to anyone dying. <laughs> okay. All right. The number of cases were actually people testing positive for a what? A polymerase chain reaction. It's not, it wasn't even a test at all. Brilliantly done. You know, the number of deaths. You only had to have someone die of a flu because guess what? No one died of flu previously. In previous years, you see, yeah. but these things were cleverly put in place. We're, we're generalizing, of course. I think they were like, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, well, we're general, but these things were cleverly too. put in place by advisors, advisors who, and you know, when you think about it, that kind, you know, a lot of them should be lined up for, for doing that. But, mm. but that's how they were able to get human beings who didn't have wholesale members of their family friends, relations, or even enemies dying every single day, right? It's how they could get those people to still believe, geez, I've got to wear a pair of underpants around my face because that's the only way I'm going to stop from myself from being one of those cases. Sure. One thing I want to speak about a little, because this touches home with me, is just the discord that this has created within families, because I see this happening for a number of reasons. But for the foremost part, it's it's a typical reaction that tends to happen with human beings when someone has a viewpoint that is 
is so not just different to their viewpoint, but it strikes at their the very way in which they see the world. Like it's connected to like I I've noticed that I can say certain things right, which I think are, are not a big deal at all. Like bro, you can have you have the power to do anything you want, right? This is a phenomenon I've been seeing, but or I'm trying to alleviate the fears of people, but because. It, it makes them question um, reality or their belief system. They get really angry about it, right? Like if you tell someone, oh, you know, things aren't really that bad. Oh, look, you don't need to be that work. This is a phenomenon I saw. I noticed Zuby was talking about how people would get so angry when you would simply try to tell them things. Oh, it's not as bad as you say they were. And like he had this amazing tweet about how he'd never seen a situation where people would get so angry at you simply for wanting to alleviate their fears. It's like people want to be afraid of what they're going through. And that's because um, by them accepting this idea that it's not as big a deal, they have to accept this idea that the media has been lying to them and so forth. It's connected to something even bigger. In terms of the situation with family, I find that worries, it's not just a matter of them um, understanding that something might be incorrect. You know, they've been told like something like, you know, it's not it's not that big a deal. You know, like, uh, you, like for, for example, um, you know, you uh, getting COVID, like if I was saying something like that, right? But it's not just that they would have to accept that it's not that big a deal. They'd have to question so many other things that they've been told that would create this, uh, this discord within them. And I just, the, the conversations I've had, I've noticed that people would have to change their belief system. The more and more they had to look at information, it would get at something at the heart, like at the foundation that they've set up in how they view reality. And that's at the, that's at the causal um, point of like creating the fracture, because it's not just a matter of, oh, really? You have a different viewpoint about um, man vaccine mandates? No, it goes deeper than that. And that's why we're seeing this massive divide, like at the heart of what is going on right now, it's questioning people's viewpoint on, on ethics, on spirituality, if you want to call it that, on so many different things. That's why like, and this, this is something that happens in my life, you know, on other issues, like when someone tells me, you know, something that I think is absolutely rubbish, you know, and gets at the, get, sticks, gets at the, the core of what I believe, you know, it's annoying and uh, it creates division, you know what I mean? And we're seeing this play out also with the, uh, the V mandates and other things. It's not just the specific issues connected to other things. That, there are my thoughts. What do you think about that? No, I think you're absolutely right. And it's interesting. It's not even a, a question of, um, you know, whether you're trying to allay someone's fears. If you, if you come at someone with facts, statistics, provable, repeatable, demonstra demonstrable statistics, if it challenges, as you say, their worldview or their, their perception of the world around them, mm -hmm. the, the word you were looking for, they get triggered triggered exactly I, I found that when i was uh, dealing with the the, the um vast reams of data that to support the information that i'm going to be presenting in my documentary mm -hmm. you, you'd speak to women for, for women and say for example here's a fact okay whilst a hundred percent of men initiate marriages 80 to 90 percent of women initiate divorces they're the ones who oh no yeah that makes perfect sense so you know what the, the rebuttal would be well that's just your opinion you see it, it wouldn't matter what the facts are because it yeah. challenges if yeah. you say for oh, example here, something else you know well who your sources oh i don't trust those sources and yeah, yeah exactly right it, exactly like, oh, right really? do you it, get that from the conspiracy uh journal oh no I yeah guess. i mean even even, even though even even yeah. though you can show them, you can show them facts and figures from the from well, the, all, all the facts and figures come from reputable um, uh, market research groups, reputable. Uh, I mean, even from the uh, you know the, the the health authority, the National Health Authority. I mean, for example, here's another one. Um, oh, that that's right. Yeah. So um, uh, the the stats are twenty eight percent of uh, black men. Um, uh, will are like will likely cheat in relationships, but that's compared to twenty four percent of black women will cheat in relationships. So the difference is almost, and yet the general perception is that well most black men cheat, whereas actually the, the, yeah, it's I mean, it's yeah. on an even it's virtually on an even footing. I would actually suspect that if you really delved into it and you asked women to be more candid, mm. I think we'd find that the stats uh, are actually 
heavily weighted uh, towards women being probably more promiscuous, more, more, more yeah. uh, you know, more unfaithful well. you know, <laughs> because, are... because they have more choices. They have more choices. Yeah. They have more options, you know, but, it's, but again, this is something that would be triggering and it doesn't matter where you present the, the data. No, it challenges their worldview. It, it's just your opinion. Mm. I heard some, someone a couple of days ago when I was disc- discussing this suddenly said, now you're being aggressive, Jimothy. You're just an aggressive person. You know, because- I've, I've, I've had that. And the problem, right, is it's one thing to disagree and say, I, I don't like your opinion and so forth. But now we've moved in this culture where we are trying to censor people. It's like you have an opinion I don't like. You're not allowed to say that thing. And we've seen this. And this is this is something I love doing. This is I think this this is psychology because where is this has been done in the realm of medical misinformation? Because this is the argument I'm hearing from a lot of the I call them momos, right? Because they they make philosophically ridiculous arguments, right? That we cannot allow information that may potentially um, lead to deaths, right? Which is I mean potential right. for anything. I could say something like you know. Black people have big butts, you know, and you might be offended by that. And that might make you go jump down the a building because you're offended that you have a small butt. But the point I'm trying to make is, all right, so they created this narrative that you can't have any medical misinformation, right, because it might cause people's deaths. So we're going to censor any of your opinions relating to medical information, all right? But now we're seeing this shift. And there was a precedent that was set just recently where DuckDuckGo, which is an alternative to Google, as right. recently start, I mean, they've openly said, I don't know if this is true, but this is what one, I think one of the CEOs said that they've always um, categorized um, certain information and put you know things that they consider misinformation on a lower list. But now they're actively uh, preventing information that is against that, that is in that is in pro favor of Russia, that whole uh, narrative. They so now we've moved away from I think we're moving away from not just medical information stuff, but now anything to do with expressing opinions in relation to war or just collect like any any social opinions that are not deemed acceptable by the society are now going to be censored in fact and we're already seeing evidence of this in the uk where people are now being convicted for expressing opinions that others don't like because they find this offensive there's a whatsapp uh, there's an exchange that took place in whatsapp a while ago where I can't remember what, what it was that was said, but it was net, it definitely wasn't an incitement of any kind of violence, but it was something that was in the realm of socially unacceptable opinions. And a guy got prison time for this. So we well, moved in the realm of, oh, wait, yeah, your, your viewpoints are triggering me, but now I'm going to ask the state to punish you because I need to be protected from these dangerous opinions because your opinions may potentially affect the world. And this is, this is the scary thing that we're seeing happen now in terms of the war as well between Russia and Ukraine. Like we're reaching a new level where you can't actively support Russia because now you're terrorists. And look, it makes sense from a classic, like a, a common law perspective, if you're incite, like let's say if you're inciting a nation to uh, uh, let's say come in and kill innocent people, right? Like that would be classically incitement of violence, right? But we're talking about saying something as simple as look, I I don't have a problem with what Russia is doing. And look, I'm, ne- I'm neither on the Russia or Ukraine camp. Like I, I acknowledge that Russia is the invader here, but there's a lot more detail than that. But we're seeing people that are simply just glorifying um, what's going on in favor of Putin being uh, at the very minimum downgraded on the ranks of uh, DuckDuckGo. And I'm pretty sure we're going to start seeing some kind of social repercussions for this in, in terms of uh, uh, legal, uh, legal enforcement and so forth. And that's the concerning thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, on 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 the the just to dovetail on on that, I my favorite football team is uh, Chelsea, and you know during the week or the last few weeks, it's, it's been suggested that uh, the 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 racist. club the, the club been to, been to, we, the Russian manager the, the, the sorry the owner of the club is a Russian Roman Ab- oh, Abramovich. No. So now we're racist uh, towards Russians, justifying. They're, they're, they're putting all they're 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 threatening all sorts of sanctions, like for example, preventing um, putting a cap on the club's internal business. So, for example, it, the, the 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 club basically does something like I don't know, uh, is it half a million or half a billion um, dollars worth of um, uh, business per day between, you know, transfer fees and running of the club and doing this. When there's, or, or, or is it, I think I've been, but they, they want to slash that. 
with arbitrarily Russia. slash that to a half. They no, want to no, say, no. like, you know, you're not allowed to do any business on the open market. You can't buy players. You can't sell players. You can't do any banking. So in other words, you can't play your, pay your existing players or your staff. It's off the chart. And this is what goes back to what I was saying, Chris, about, you know, creating these um uh, creating these events, which are then spin-offs of just more oppression, more control, more draconian rhetorics, essentially, that if you like, if you like, just bind you further, mummify you almost in terms of your, your freedoms, you see? So we had one set of unbelievable draconian you know, uh, restrictions placed on us, including movement for crying out, sorry, for, That's for crying out loud. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now you've got war in something like Ukraine. Now you've got basically, well, if you're choosing or you're sympathetic or seem to be seemingly sympathetic or not openly against Russia, uh, you need to be penalized for also oh, now it's, it's thought, oh, thought yeah. crime. Yeah, exactly. And you know what the biggest thought crime of all? Like, I, I watched some, some friend of mine sent me um, a link to this, and this blew my mind. Because where is there's this whole structure of like who can get away with things? Like, first you have, so you have, um, you know, let's say, okay, so you have, I would say, um, black people, like, you, you know, because we're considered to be like the, you know, the press class and so forth. You can get away with saying a lot of shit, right? But then you got the alphabet crew who are like on a new level now. They're like even more powerful than black people, right? But then on top of, I actually found out, you know who's more powerful than black people? You know who's more powerful than black people? Yeah. It starts with J, yo. <laughs> the Jews, you don't, you don't touch. Oh, I mean, you must have heard the book, book was, Goldberg thing as well, didn't yeah, you? Like I was that. just about to mention that. So oh. like, you, you've obviously seen this situation. Yeah. Where Whoopi Goldberg said some, what seemed to me, and granted, maybe I'm just a weird thinker, seemed to be some, you know, pretty fair statements in regards to the Holocaust. Now, anyone knows the, first of all, the Holocaust is, is out of bounds um, unless you're a Jew. Otherwise, you should be very careful where you are stepping i, I don't know up. how i've managed to safeguard my channel from from that sort of talk i, I tell you yeah. what it's we probably crazy. shouldn't go there man because you know, no, 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 no. I, I think jewish people are the most amazing people in the entire world by the way right I, I just so amazing send me lots of money <laughs> <laughs> no but the whole thing is it's what i found so fascinating whereas that where is typically you think that a black woman is going to avoid being called racist and avoid these uh, uh this targeting but they went after her basically Whoopi said that the the holocaust wasn't really about white supremacy because it dealt with one class yes, of that's people, right. yeah. uh, that yeah. were white um oppressing another class of people this whole we're better than you you know because of our race the fundam fundamentally white supremacy kind of deals with white race kind of thing and she was essentially making the argument that it was about man's humanity inhumanity to man which I fucking love because it takes it away. I hate, um, I, I hate like identity politics. She brought it into the realm of the human element, like the, the fact that e people do horrible things regardless of their race, right? Yeah. And she got destroyed for it. She was told that she, you know, it's not, it was not about that. It was about white supremacy, even though, um, you know, the, we're dealing with races here that are essentially of the, I mean, I think the whole thing is ridiculous if you want to call someone white or black. I mean, you have... Well, I mean, the, see, the thing is, the danger of, you know, bringing what we're seeing down to a level of, you know, man, man's evil against man mm -hmm. is that you you'll start getting people sympathetic towards each other, regardless of what whether they look a different way or whatever else. The New World Order don't want that. They need us to be divided yeah. along many, many different lines. You see, yeah, so, I, so, I so, there. yeah, sure. Yeah. I'd, I'd always, I'd, I just also attribute that kind of stuff just to, like, I think there is something about people that tend to be tribal. I mean, you can make the argument they've been, uh, this stuff has been orchestrated to make them think like that. But from a very, um, like, you, you can go back many, you know, I would argue hundreds, even thousands of years ago, and you see the, the tribal elements taking place where people need to feel as if they're part of one group. And, right. uh, just the, I think there is a, a, a case to be made that, people like belonging to a group and uh like to play this us versus them game and where is the this like even within the uh the, t the torah the, the the jewish tradition they they have this they have a very strong uh culture code of how you treat their people they're very strongly knitted within their belief system 
and the culture and so forth. This is why, you know, they, they have a certain way of treating other Jews versus the goyim and so forth, right? And it creates a very strong element of this is who we are, you're part of our group. Then there's the other, the sheeple, the, the goyim and so forth. And many cultures have this ingrained within them, this us versus them, you're different. And as a result, they tend to cling to that and they tend to make, form their arguments around your, you know, that, that kind of mentality. And it's, it's a problem, I think, because it's what leads to the, the war that is going on right now that may very well eventuate. I mean, what do you think? Do you think this has the potential? Let's leave it off here. Like we, ha like, we haven't really spoken about the significance of this war in terms of the nuclear devastation that might befall. Do you think this is po it's possible that we could see a, a World War III emerge from this thing? Wow. <clears throat> yeah, look, it, it's... It, it... <sighs> Yeah, look, you know, timeline of the depopulation was set at what, 2025, if you go by the uh, Georgia Stone. Uh, Georgia Guidestone, but also there was that website that was put out. Um, I can't remember what it's called now. Uh, it, was, it was a US website, US military website. Um, it, it'll, it'll come to me in a second. But essentially, um, that was the deadline. We're at 2022, so we've got three years. Uh, world war is definitely possible. I don't think that they would need to go all out to nuclear war. I don't think they'd go to that. Yeah, that's uh, I just, I just yeah. think that there are other things because, because ultimately, the, you see, the other facet of the depopulation is, well, what are you going to do with the ones who are left? Oh, yeah. that's right, transhumanism. Okay. So, so, that, so go on. Yeah, so 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 um, it, it, so that ends then. I don't think that you'd need a. I don't think they would need to do. I don't think they would use a a, a new, look a nuclear strike, which would wipe out most of, would cause too much uh, devastation. It's too messy. So. We, we both made this comment, uh, was it last, uh, it was either yourself or, or Craig, we ma made the comment on my channel that, you know what, they were able to pull off mass global behavioral change, you know, everyone getting jabbed. And I think I'd be surprised if a dozen people around the globe were, were, were shot by military or whatever else. I'd be surprised if there was anywhere near that. They didn't even need to do that. And yet they were able to, to, to create havoc and, and wide scale change to human behavior. I also therefore think that they don't need like a, an all that nuclear attack to do what they want to do. I don't think they need to do that. Sure. Uh, the way I look at it is this. One is that I think of this African proverb that the, the kid that is ignored by the tribe will set the, the town on fire to feel its warmth. I think it's something that effect. And if you look at this in a grander scale as to what we're doing to Russia right now in terms of cutting it out with all these sanctions and treating it as this great evil, um, Putin, but spe specifically Russia, it's possible, uh, foreseeable that at some point they may react because Putin has actually said, and I believe him, I don't think he's bluffing, that he has escalated the situation to put his nuclear weapons on alert. And I think it's foreseeable that everyone thinks this is a precedent in history. People say that certain weapons will never be used like before the nuclear weapons, we still had destructive weapons, like with fire bombs. Um, they're, they're incredibly like they'd they be considered like horrific weapons. You know, this is back in the 1950s, I think it was right. The way it's been described to me, very, very horrible shit. Right. But what happens is you start using this stuff. You set this precedent and uh, it escalates. I think it's possible that we'll start seeing many nukes, like perhaps a, a nuclear bomb in the future being dropped off in an area where they're not that many people just to show for Putin to show look the line has been crossed you see it can happen because we have one for starters use nuclear weapons right like the united states use spent uraniums um shells on in so many of their campaigns in iraq they their apache helicopters have mini nukes but they're just it's not just defined as a nuclear weapon and so that's one thing i think the way that we continue treating russia there's the possibility uh, definitely i think we're not to not to look at this as a possibility when they're openly, he's openly saying that he's willing to do this just to go, oh, no, they won't do that. I think you subscribe to that view when you subscribe to the view that everything is controlled, that we're not just dealing with individuals here. Because I'm hearing you say that, look, it, they won't allow it to happen, right? 
but we're also dealing with like people that get crazy and want like you have one person like someone like um oh who's his name mr crazy uh president of the united states uh donald trump right <laughs> he, yeah i know but he has he has he technically from what i understand um has the power like one man because of the, the just the situation of let's say russia deciding to launch nuclear weapons on um united states one per if we have too many people deciding what they're going to do it doesn't really work so one person effectively from what i understand has the power to launch nuclear weapons and when you have a situation like that it, it all it takes is one crazy monkey to say, yeah, yeah, I know we have this big plan and whatnot, but these guys are pissing me off. This is why we fear people like, um, you know, the, the guy in charge of North Korea. And this is also, and the other thing, right, is that we have this mentality, mutual assured destruction. The countries won't um, launch a nuclear weapon on us because we'll launch, launch a nuclear weapon on them. When you have a country that has an ideology that we're going to have so and so many um, virgins, you know, in the afterlife and so forth, and they're not concerned about, uh, like it's the same mentality of kamikaze pilots, then they're willing to take people down with them. So the idea that these one certain nations won't use this, the United States knows that they will. That's why they've they've done a lot of the evil things they have because they've been trying to preserve this shit for a long time, right? And two, I think the way that we're treating these countries. Um, Eventually, it's foreseeable, particularly Russia, that they will take steps to um, go to that new level. Because it, w I don't think you want to run the risk of being known as the country that uh, lost ever. If you're Mr. Putin, you don't want to go down to defeat. And I just think about human nature, and I think it's definitely possible that we will see. Like I think in my li lifetime, we will see a nuclear war. That's just what I believe. I, I hope it doesn't happen, but. Um, I, th I think it's amazing that it hasn't happened so far. I think that's more amazing than anything else. I think there's a lot more going on than what we're being shown. Look, I, I think your thoughts are um, certainly what <clears throat> a, lo a lot of um, the chat that's coming through my channel. Mm -hmm. However, you know, I, I tend to look, <laughs> I, I, still, I still strongly believe that, that um, look, in their push to totally wipe out humanity. They've left no stone unturned. Mm -hmm. And war definitely being a useful weapon um, to enact change because problem, reaction, solution. So the problem now is a rogue Russian uh, 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 president who's threatening nuclear war. Now, mm -hmm. reaction to that is, well, on the national, international level, to push through changes to the way we live our lives such that you, to, to the point that you, levels of change that you wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do prior to this perceived threat. 100%. I mean, for example, you know, after 9-11, my gosh, I mean, it, it, you had everyone on terrorist alert. You were introducing body scanners at the airports and stuff like that. I mean, n n nobody would have... Um, you know, agree to that sort of level of a, an invasion of privacy and what have you else. Mm -hmm. Pandemic came across that basically now you, you, you people are allowing themselves to be hauled up in facilities, you know, for 14 days, at 10 to 14 days at a time, you know, whilst they're pr supposedly cleared of having some sort of whatever else, you know, and the perceived nuclear attack from, a, 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 you know, a madman in Russia Mm -hmm. Geez, that, that's enough to have you hold up in a room, basically, <laughs> until the government says it's safe for you to come out now. You know, it, it, look, it, 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 the, the solution that they're going to bring forward as a result of this problem of this madman in Russia, come on, it will fall in line with all the you know, the nice to haves that the New World Order and the WEF and Klaus Schwab has been promising for decades. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the one thing that always puts a stump, though, on um, plans is the ever-changing nature of technology when people are trying to orchestrate how history is, is created. Yeah, but, but who's and in control of that technology? But, that, but that's the thing about technology. Like, it's not as predictable as you think it is. Like, there's something called the technological singularity, where you can see the rapid growth of technology on an exponential growth curve. It hits this point where it explodes. And, like, this is how Ray Kurzweil explains it. Like, our ability as human beings to perceive this growth 
is no longer perceptible unless you augment your physiology with artificial intelligence. Like there are certain, this is the history of, of, of society. Like there've always been technological or you'd say psychological innovations that have shifted the entire um, landscape of things. We're like, what? You know, you, everything is one way. And then, oh, then we start using, um, I don't know, like uh, oh, guns, you know, and then that changes the landscape. Or then we start using X and Y. I would say that one thing here is the, the I recently came across, right? And this is pretty much what started everything we've seen in the last two years, is a technology they've started using on mosquitoes. The Bill Gates and Melinda Foundation's foundation are supporting an organization that has recently deployed uh, genetically modified mosquitoes. Um, I wish I could remember what country. Oh, that's right. California and Florida, right? In order to address um, certain viruses like the Zika virus and I think it's malaria or so forth. And look, fair enough. This is, this is stuff they're reporting in the mainstream. However, what if, and this is the what if, this is the conspiracy theory. What if they start implementing this technology to, uh, to, to, to essentially uh, to put forth like vaccines on people, you know? Because I mean, if you can genetically monitor, or, or who knows what, you know? Because this is, they've made documentaries about this kind of stuff. Wouldn't this be a better way of controlling the population if you could just genetically modify mosquitoes that could drop their <laughs> their uh, their their stuff on and essentially their payload? Their payloads. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, 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 these are the technologies that we have. I think the potential is just it's just so it's just so overbearing sometimes. Like in regards to what might happen, and we always tend to overlook these things. I mean, a couple of years ago, you may you probably wouldn't have been thinking about the idea of genetically modified mosquitoes, you know, being used in order to change the ecology of an environment. But that's mm. where we're at in the 21st century. Well, I mean, look, it's sad to say that I was aware that Bill Gates had been uh, funding to the tune so of. You know, yeah. it, so, so no, it's not ago, news yeah. to me at all. But yeah. I think you, you mentioned something in passing there and you, and you said that, that, that just the sheer, you, you know, I'm paraphrasing, the sheer, um, scale of possibilities is something that we just can't fathom. And that's exactly true. And I believe the reason for that is that, you know, there are so many agendas being pushed by entities that are on a different level. They're that. on a different frequency from us. What they want from us, how they're going to play us, is just we simply could not conceive of that they're definitely not like us they have a game plan um and yes indeed i actually do believe that look look with eight billion minds you need to have left no stone unturned I'm and so i believe this that. is the, the, and i believe this is why we've got yeah. social media and all these platforms and i mean effectively they're listening in on us you apply artificial intelligent uh, algorithms and machine learning algorithms on top of that on top of an inf uh, an, uh, a quantum uh computing architecture well you've you've got a mind that basically knows what chris is going to do given an event already sure. you, so you, you've heard you've, you've heard about the um the uh, um, sentient world simulation. Yes, I was thinking about that just as you were speaking. And people like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, many of these figures, Ray Kurzweil, subscribe to this way of thinking. They believe in this materialistic worldview that human beings are predictable. But someone like you, some, someone definitely like myself, believe that there is this unquantifiable element to the human spirit where we are not just the, the sum of our parts. Like there is an intrinsic quality about us that makes us unpredictable. Like I don't believe that you can quantify every single thing that is going to happen, right? Like there is this indomitable will, indomitable will of the human spirit to overcome adversity. So whereas you have one side of people wanting to control this, wanting to suppress the human spirit in order to bring about this greater good, right? But then there is the, the side of the human soul, the human spirit, right? That is, is not quantifiable. And I truly believe that there is, there's always going to be an element of unpredictability that is as much as the one side will try to control everything. I only have to look to history to find elements of how their plans have been thwarted for things they never suspected. A few hundred years ago, people would have thought the idea of abolishing slavery was impossible because it's just so ingrained within society. But of course, all, all it took was a small group of people with the spirit to believe that it could be. 
And eventually that changes the very landscape of society. And I think the same applies on so many different levels. I'm not denying that what you're saying is true, that there are all these plans and agendas in order to not leave no stone un unturned. But the question is whether or not that will account for everything and leave every stone unturned. And I think the very nature of us is that you can't quantify the future because the future doesn't exist. There's always the potential for infinite change and overcoming adversity. That, that, that's a very, very good point, you see. Yes, you, you know, that's, <laughs> I actually heard that somebody in my family actually did say that the future does not exist. So what can you do then? Well, you essentially create the future. You manipulate the present, sorry, mm -hmm. in order to have the future that you want. Uh, but, but all that aside... <laughs> I actually believe you. I concur with you. I, I think that there is an aspect of humanity that you will not con control. And that is as long as you do not, you, you step out of the game, step out of the illusion. And mm -hmm. one of the ways I feel that, the, well, the key way that I feel that each um, individual in humanity can do that is through our spirit or the, the, the Holy Spirit. I actually really do. Because then we're working on a totally different frequency from that with which our enemy is working on. Mm. And so that, that sets you free. And in, in, that, in that frequency, we behave very, very different. We're not subject to the triggers. We're not subject to the uh, problem reaction and solutions. Oh, no, no, no. We are, we are working on a different frequency, okay, different network altogether. And we will do as per, and we will stay very, very um, focused on in that lane. We will not budge and, 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 you know, serve our ultimate purpose as a result of, but it's getting on that frequency. That's the key. Well, that's, that's brilliant. You know, I, I was wanting to uh, uh, say something very similar, but you, you put that, so brilliantly, man. And I, I resonate with everything you're saying there. Jamithi, I think that's a good place to end it. It's been a pleasure having you on uh, for it's been a, an hour and a half. It's trying to keep to an hour. Right? There's so much stuff we always get into. There is a <laughs> lot of stuff going on in the world. And it's great that people like you are keeping everyone apprised of this. I think um, over the next few weeks and months, you know, days are going to feel like months. And we've been I seeing know. this escalation of events. I thought this pandemic was going to be the main thing for a long time. But now it looks like we're already emerging into another war. It could be a world war. And uh, bro, I just want to say, as I always do, keep up the great work. I love the, the Planned Illusion podcast. You keep dropping. And the, uh, the, yeah, this, the, the conversation that it, uh, it brings about and just all the work you're doing, brother. Kudos it's to you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. I mean, look, look my, um, <laughs> as I said to you before, you, you know, you started recording, that I've, I've tried my best of recent, of late, to live as much of a normal life as possible. Um, as I say, doing this research has, has enabled me to get out there and get amongst people because that, that's what life is about, isn't it? it? Get amongst people, not just hold up in, in, in our little, you know, uh, boxes, basically. Mm. Uh, human, our reality is based on our interaction with other people in their reality to create new realities, you know, and, um, that uh, it's been enjoyable to do that. And, and it was something that I've been telling people to do. And I went ahead and did it myself. And I can, I always strongly recommend it. Although it doesn't come without its pitfalls. I'm sure. I wanted to ask you, actually, do you find the more that you learn, the more difficult it becomes to actually live amongst the normies because you are finding the information is so mind blowing that it's hard to be apathetic or at least even try to be apathetic? There is no doubt about that. Even, even realizing that the, the theory is actually reality when you mm -hmm. go amongst the people, you, you're, you're leaving that reality. Yeah. Looking at myself and thinking, wow, because I don't see the world like they do. I'm experiencing what they're experiencing but my perception of it is very, very different. And like we were alluding to before, you know, people always fall back on, well, um, it's just your opinion. Yeah. Well, sometimes, I mean, look, when we're talking about, I always make a distinction about what's going to happen. That's filming in the realm of like, we've already spoken about the future potentiality. Now, granted, there are also plans, things that people are trying to bring about that we can 
definitively say are in effect and trying to um, bring about. So that's not just an opinion, but yeah, there are certain things that are opinions, but then there's a lot of stuff that are not. It's when people, there, when, particularly when we're talking about history, there are certain things that have happened. And when people try to, and look, we can debate as to certain things that happened, but to say that no truth can be observed, like things like that, I hit that, it happened. There are some people that want to pretend that, no, that didn't happen. That's just a perception of a reality. There's some momos that want to pretend that everything is an opinion. And as soon as you have, this is kind of like the, the, the worldview of the, you know, the, the lefties that want to pretend that everything is just an opinion. And as a result, it's just as viable for me to have an opinion that says I'm a woman when I'm a man and that left is right and right is left. And that's when uh, that, that's, I think that's not on purpose. That does seem to be. Oh, no, no, that's weaponized, isn't it? That's, that's, yeah. that's a weaponization. Isn't it, Absolutely. Because really? it, oh. it destroys your argument. It takes away the validity of it. It's like saying, oh, they're just your sources. Um, I don't trust. Well, well, I mean, what I normally do is basically I always go back to, well, what is the outcome? We, we, you can say that this is opinions, but what's the outcome? What is the outcome today? What is the outcome likely to, tomorrow? If we go back to the whole relationship thing. I always, you know, you know, I meet so many strong, independent, entrepreneurial women, women sure. who are quite happy to if they're if the outcome for them is, oh, I'm going to be a single at uh, 60 or 65 alone with a dog. And I yeah. say to them, you do realize that the WEF and Agenda 2030, they got plans to extinct you well before then. You do realize that. And most of them don't. You see, we can, we can have opinions totally in the absence of the reality of, say, for example, listen, you've got two routes to get um, to your destination, mm -hmm. A and B. And I can turn around and say, well, in, in actual fact, route B is the only route that you've got. And you'll say, well, that, that's just your opinion. Well, how do you but know just, just, you just know to cap that off there. Well, right. exactly. This is it. And okay. So, so why, why do I say that? Oh, because I happen to know there's a damn ditch <laughs> on, on uh, okay, halfway well, down route B, the, route A. It's one thing if you can see the ditch. I mean, in this, in the context of this uh, analogy, like if you can visually see it. But when we're looking at the future, we're looking at at least now, unless you believe the future, it, like that, that's the thing we're, we're dealing in potentiality. You're essentially saying with your analogy that you can see something that is going to happen. No, no, no. It, realize, it, you're, you're right. It's, look, pot yeah, potentiality is really a divide. philosophical issue. Okay, potentiality is really divided into two real, very quantifiable things. Okay. Probability and possibility. Okay, I put them in the same. I put, oh, actually, how do you define possibility? In terms. Okay, like, so so the possibility. Well, um, it, it, look, it's possible for me to win the lottery. Yes. But what is the probability of you sure. winning? Sure, but even, yes, this is. I love the fact that you brought this up. But even and look. I understand that there is a scientific formula, you know, the, the mathematics behind probability. And like, we can get into this another time because there are experiments I've done that have blown this out of the water. You know, like someone telling me there's a one in 50,000 chance of this happening. I'm like, bro, that's happened. And that shouldn't have happened within the, but the point is even within the realm of probability, you're making an assessment on likelihood. And that's still in the realm of possibility. Like when you're saying there is a 50, 50% chance that if you, uh, if you um, throw a, throw a dice you know that has one and two you know that'll it's going to land on one right um there it's still a, a pot it's still a possibility like it's you're still making a sense which of what do you is live your life on which Sorry? do you live your the, 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 the question is which do you live your life on or base your life on sure you, 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 simply that's fair enough. But the point I'm trying to make is still the, it's still within the realm of you're making assessment on what you think is going to happen. And it's based I'm on making an assessment on probability. probability. Yes, there is a probability metric, like an assessment of the likelihood, but it's still like philosophically speaking, because I understand what you're saying, it, but I always delineate between the two because what well, you're using science in order to make the argument there is a likelihood, there is an assessment on how likely something is to happen. But that very idea is still a it's it's still within the realm of like it's not necessarily going to be the case but, but the that, problem is that, that when you look at it from that point of view you yeah. allow what the lefties are doing or whatever else which is to weaponize the possibility in order to get you believe oh there's a pandemic and you're going to die 
I would have said the opposite. I think is the there. I'm I'm denying both approaches. Because here's the thing: if you're saying because this is what we do in terms of the lockdowns, right? And saying and saying that look, because there is a, a possible probability, probabilistically speaking, that if you take let's say a jab, it's going to a do this and do that. That's within the realm of probabilistic models, right? That are based off in science, and that's very subjective. Like we could debate with different scientists in regards to what that probability is based off of different evidence, right? What I'm saying is I'm acknowledging the fact that it is a probability it's it's not it's not definitive like even the idea that saying it's definitively a measurable and probabilistic model that's describing to the left as worldview because that's saying that you can predict what is going to happen in the future i'm saying i'm taking on the the pr approach that you can't definitively do that therefore i'm moving away from this possibility approach to looking at the world and saying that i'm going to lock you up because there's a possibility a probability that you're going to infect more and more people right unless but the, the only problem i mean it, it, you see that you see that argument what Look, you see, in its essence, we know it works, but where that argument, okay, and when I say we know it works, mm -hmm. we know if you base your life on the probability, probability, and look at those numbers, okay? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. But you see, if I was your enemy, I would just lie to you that the probability is X, Y, Z. In other words, they, they just simply lie about the probability of. Mm -hmm. so, 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 so now, possibility and probability to a liar is one in the same. Sure, but it, the, the problem is that because there is a subjective element when we're looking at probability, like for instance, even from the mathematical approach, right? Like there's something, we can go into this, there's something called a Monty Hall problem, and uh, the top um, high, highest IQ people will take on the scientific uh, um explanation of uh, talking about like the likelihood of something happening. I won't go into the details of this, right? But I, I looked at this problem many, many, many times, right? And you come to the, at least the philosophical conclusion because anytime you're looking at something from a probabilistic standpoint, you're still dealing in the realm of like, you're saying definitively that this is going to happen. Like if you, within the realm of probability that let's say there is a, there's a 30% chance that you're going to um, succeed at something, right? That um, that's going to hold when the reality is it's, it's a subjective assessment on the 30% um, likelihood. And that, I mean, that's fair enough. Things, I'll just finish by saying that different scientists, like the, the, the realm of probability, it's an element of subjectivity. And the issue I have is that we're taking something as uh, that is a probability, like it's a, a subjective assessment. And a lot of people are saying that that is a definitive thing, saying, that, oh, no, there's a, it's a definitive 30% chance. You can't actually quantify the likely, it's not a definitive thing. It's, a, it's within the realm, within the science of probability, you're saying there's a 30% chance of something happening. But objectively, you can't, you can't say that. You can't say that if I put on a mask or I do this, it's definitively going to uh, lead to a 30% likelihood of any outcome based up because you're using statistics you're there is always going to be a subjective element to that assessment you're well i mean with, look yeah. uh, here's the thing here's the thing mm. it's an easy way to settle this argument let's take away probability and possibility from our existence you know what you have nothing you have absolute chaos have, our whole I world I our, our, our whole chaos. world is a, right okay so so it so it's so if you were the enemies of humanity sure you would weaponize this notion of probability. You'd lie, for one thing. 100%. You'd skew the definition between the two and yeah. tell people, look, at the end of the day, okay, don't worry, on the one hand, don't worry about the probability of something if it goes against our narrative, right? But worry about the possibility of this thing because it serves our narrative. That's called a weaponization. Because the, 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 all right, I I I think I I understand what you're saying. Because my my whole perspective on this right is is, is the opposite. That the, the what we're seeing in the world right now, I I could agree. The the baddie, the baddies, right? We'll call them baddies. Like the Marxists, <laughs> they're weaponizing the idea of probability and possibility, right? Whereas within the realm of natural law, right, you don't have that. You don't say that. I'm going to enforce something on you because there's the probability or possibility of this happening. That whole security argument, and this is actually definitively within the realm of what you call natural law, like common law is typically the written version of the natural law, but it's based off of principles, booleans, like it's either right or it's wrong. If it's wrong for me to do something, like if it's wrong for me to 
kill someone, it's wrong for me to kill someone. You know, you'd say uh, if they're attacking me, you know, in self-defense, it's fair enough. But if you say it's okay for me to kill someone, if I think there's the potential, there's a 50% chance, right? My subjective assessment that they may, uh, this is what Russia's doing, because there's the possibility that NATO, the NATO when they go into Ukraine, may uh, eventually start using their influence to, uh, to circumvent what goes on in Russia. The possibility or the probability, that's how you weaponize evil. From a natural law sense, you don't actually use any probability or possibility when you're making definitive statements. The reason we're seeing what we're seeing from a purely from a common law legal perspective is because people are using the secure, this is the thing that happens all the time, um, the greater good, right? We're willing to circumvent someone's natural rights for the greater good. There is no greater good. That's a probabilistic mentality. As soon as you say we're going to take away your God-given liberties, your rights, because of the probability or possibility that's actually when you move into the realm of this moral relativistic worldview. And that's actually what is being done by the leftists all around the world at the moment. I think essentially we're, 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 we're actually um, agreeing on, 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 on this particular matter, because essentially what you're saying is that, you know, um, if you work in the realms of possibility and probability, then it can be weaponized in favor of, which is essentially, essentially what I'm saying. But what you're saying is, but if you work on the holistic moral view, and now let, let's, let's, let's say in my speak, okay. if you work on God's law, then there is no probability, uh, a possibility. It, sure, you know, sure. you do as the law commands, because, you know, there is a binary outcome, basically. Sure. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. But can I just add that when you, because you're delineating between probability and possibility, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're making the, the, the statement that because there is a distinction between, between these two things, we have to acknowledge the fact that probability is more of a definitive thing. And as a result, this can be used. The, the impression that I was getting is that we can use probability in order to, I would have thought, from your from what you're saying to justify some of these things because whereas i'm saying that no 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 i'm not i'm not I, you're absolutely right i wouldn't use probability sorry you're right i, I wouldn't use probability you know because i acknowledge it, it exists it's a like there yes it's yes however, you're, you're saying however it's not a definitive like it's it's like a an advanced form of science it's like it is it's to me it's like a it's yeah it's an it's it's almost like a for lack of a better word, like a technology, it's an assessment where you can predict what is likely to happen, but it's not, it's not a Boolean. You can't always know that the future, like when you're talking about seeing the, the ditch at the end of the hole, so at the end of the path, right? That's like, uh, that's a potential, you're potentially seeing a ditch there. It's not definitive. But, but look, I'll tell you something, artificial intelligence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Is, yeah. There are many, okay, there, so there are, you know, we're talking combinatorial analysis based on past information that that, that has then been, you know, uh, computed. It's been analyzed. You know, the what ifs, the B tree analysis. That, that that you know, and then looking at that to extrapolate that to many, many, many nth degrees forward. Absolutely. Sometimes thousands, millions of them. Look, you know, because and such is the power of probability that, for example, uh, you know, uh, I think it was uh, Google, uh, I think Google Minds, I think the company's called or Google Deep Mind. Deep Mind. The Google the Deep Mind. Yeah, using this to go against the chess players. I, I knew wow. exactly. No. Yeah. yeah no, absolutely right. That's absolutely. exactly where I was going I to go. I'm in That's an example of that. That's an example of where, I mean, yeah. you're talking a game that effectively requires an artistic mind. It contains so many different, mm. and yet they were, they, they, based on an algorithm, this algorithm was successful in beating at least at all four games to one. Absolutely. Scary. I mean, I watched this, I watched the, 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 um, the, the episode, and I'm not joking, by the time they got to the third game, I was actually, <laughs> I had a sense that a, a being had been created and off the back of oh, what? Wow, this is, this is huge implications. So wait, yes, can, I, yes, can I just yes. confirm this? Because I haven't followed this for about 10, 15 years. Because the last time I followed this was like towards the end of high school where Kasparov, the world's greatest chess player, had beaten the deep blue uh, computer that was created by uh, IBM or something like that, right? But that was a long time ago. Are you saying there's actually a point now where the, the artificial intelligence is beating the world's best chess player like 
many. Oh no, no, no. Okay, let, let, let me let me be specific. Okay. There is another game that supersedes um, okay. chess to the value of centuries. It is Go. Alpha. Okay. So that's a big basically, call. it oh, like chess. Bigger it, it's, than chess. Or it's 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 on another level. It, it's basically was played mostly by Chinese, and it essentially oh, okay. it has an infinite. Um, it has so many more squares. Sure. You know, m- m- many yeah. more. The number of possible. Yeah. The number n- the number of permutations for that you can move a piece mm-hmm. is just almost it, it exceeds the number of known possibilities or computations okay. in the known universe yeah okay and so you know the, <laughs> there's a tradition in in china and you know uh places like korea mm. where you know the kids from very very young are taught this game it is you know and you know the best players have like 15 20 years of experience and they're, they're virtual superstars once one such guy is lisa uh, lisa Do, i think his name was and mm. such is the complexity of the game that the mere thought that they somebody would create a computer to go up against a human with the best mind was just laughable. They literally thought, no, this, this is an absolute joke, all right? Um, so Google created, uh, the uh, um, I think it was called Google Deep Mind. Yeah. All right? And what they did was using every game that's ever been played and documented they fed that into the algorithm and also a a number of other uh, computational uh call it call it computational analysis modules were, were stuffed in add to that the They wouldn't admit to it, but this, 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 okay, this is my own personal conjecture. Yeah. So they built this on a an artificial, inter- sorry, a quantum architecture. So, yeah, so yeah. this this is an architecture. You know, you talk about like um, quant- you talk about bits, like a number of bits in a computer. Well, yeah. quantum architecture uses quantum bits, qubits. So, whereas, say, for example, in say eight bits, you can have so many numbers of uh, uh, computations. Two to the power of two, to the power of three, four, five, and whatever else. Well, with a qubit, it's infinitely a lot more. So, yeah. so they built this architecture, yeah, and then housed an a, 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 an AI algorithm with full access to all the games. Then use machine learning uh, techniques so that it could learn off of those old games mm-hmm. and learn how to play the game essentially. Absolutely. And then, then they pitted it against uh, a, a, a fairly well-known champion and, and basically honed its skills, looked at the analysis, looked at the, the data readouts from its losses mm-hmm. and got it to teach itself how to win. Now, when it came to playing Lisa Doll, this is how dangerous this thing was. Just using a high level computational analysis on a quantum level. Quantum level. Yeah. This thing, there was, I remember there was one move that it made where the the um the commentators and, and analysts around the world were like, mate, why is it why has the computer made this move? No human would make such a move. This is crazy. Lee Sidol himself is sat there thinking, what? In all my years of playing, I'm, this, this move is just nonsense. Yeah. The- anyway, within a, within a few more moves, mm-hmm. it became clear what it had done. It set itself up for the most beautiful end game move ever, just because it had made this one move 50 moves before. And it understood the human well enough by having a look at all of the prior uh, patterns. And this is the fundamental argument for what you're saying, you know, that you can essentially predict what is going to happen and understand. There's a branch of it called predictive analysis. Yeah, I am I am very familiar. This is the most fascinating stuff because this is what so many of the futurists, the materials are in favor of, like Ray Kurzweil, they talk about this stuff. That And the point you made when you were talking about how it was like watching consciousness emerge like they, yeah, it's to be honest, it's scary stuff, right? Because to me, the idea there's this science fiction um, show 
called Westworld, I think was, I, I may have stopped up the, the name, but essentially where um, people go to uh, some kind of theme park and they see artificial intelligence and they treat these things as if they're, they're just not human, right? But they, for all means and purposes, they pass the Turing test. You can't right. detect that, well, you apparently can't detect the fact that these things are, are robots. And the question within this is that, can technology become so advanced that you can't distinguish the hum, human aspect of it, like that which gives it soul, because from what you're saying, what I gather is if something becomes sophisticated enough, intelligent enough, def uh, definitely within this game, it's going to behave on a level, at least on a, on a left brain level, that is um, that of what you think has consciousness. And I don't know what that means to you. But my idea is that there's a distinction between calculations, just um, like doing all this computation in your head, and then there's this creative process that takes place within something that truly has like uh the, the call of, for lack of a better like the the animating force of god working through it it's something that i think is inherent within um sentient beings you know what i mean like this right. creative ability this is something that eon musk would uh, call me up on this but i think is a lot more difficult to replicate with a computer right and the thing is we're now seeing a point where we're blurring the lines between even creativity and uh computation because whereas you made the point right that we went, never would have thought that a computer would be able to become as advanced to do to beat uh, a, someone at the game of whatever it's called, right? I would Go. have thought that if it's on a computational level, the one thing the computers are supposed to be better at than human beings is doing calculations, computation. But it's the creative ability. Because I, I don't know about this game, but definitely in chess, because there is a creative aspect to that game, there are certain things. This is why, at least 10 years ago, that humans were the best chess players were actually able to beat the computer. But, but, that, the, but that was why they picked this game Go. This Go was is a far more creative and far more, you know, uh, 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 more spatial awareness game. They, 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 they picked it. it. It was Google showing off, essentially. Sure. And look, I don't know, you know anything about this game, but I'd, I'd say that chess, it has elements of the game you're talking about, but nowhere near as sophisticated. Nowhere near as sophisticated. But the, yeah, but the, the premise is that because there is an element of, creativity involved in this there's always going to be i would have thought an element the computers would not be able to do exactly and exactly we're seeing now that computers are actually able to even manufacture creativity um and i've seen this in other games not um, unlike I, I think also chris is because of the speed of thought if you're on these quantum you know um architecture these, sure. these computers built on, on on the quantum architecture you're now looking at um, the, the speed of computation so fast that effectively they 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 they, they can go they can process at a is, rate that, that human brain that just can't though? do. To you, is that all it means to be a human though? Like it's just no, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't question, because right? because the other thing is the other thing is yeah, it doesn't have a soul. Well, what is how does a soul affect? The, the, uh, the intellectual process. Because from a psychological level, I would say that where is there, we talk about left brain intelligence architecturally, right? Like it's supposed to represent what a computer does. It's like input and then output. It's able to process. It's, it's basically- Well, I mean, to be fair, a soul, a soul is that which is breathed in by God. That's, we're yeah. talking about different yeah, network. That, we're talking I, about I, a different I, network. We're yeah, talking about totally a, different frequency absolutely, network. Absolutely, absolutely. I was just about, I was going to contrast the two, right? I, yeah. I would associate creativity, right? Like um, it comes from like, or genius, right? And the, the, there is this, what I call the generating principle, which is like, you have a look at like, it's this ability to actually create, like to actually, like not just from what you've been given from the information that you've taken within, but it's coming from, it's from what I would call um, God, Krishna, Buddha, Allah, whatever you want to call it, you know, like the unifying field, there is an element within us. And this is the, this is me becoming philosophical with this approach that is beyond the input that we are receiving from this environment. And be, when you're actually doing creativity, like there is something about that, that removes you from the Euclidean meat space of the, the computer world that I don't believe. And that's, I say the word believe because this is just what I feel right now that a computer would not be able to replicate. So on some level, humans are going like this. I could be wrong. Maybe we'll see what happens. But I don't believe that this, these quantum computers will, even in their most unbelievable states, be able to, they may make us perceive that they're behaving like humans, right? Because you're familiar with the Turing test, right? This yes, is the point indeed, where, yeah. Indeed. 
Absolutely. I don't believe that even if something presents itself as a human being, like it, it manufactures all of the, the same responses to things like a human being, that it is a human being. It's just advanced computation. And I think truly on an intuitive level, you, you're always going to be able to discern um, between a, a fake, um, like a, a computer, you know, posing as a human being and uh, an actual being that has the spirit of God working through it. And that's my belief that just to me, it, I don't see the idea of intelligence forming from nothingness other than computation. It seems to be like it's a materialistic worldview. This is what many of the people like Elon Musk, a lot of these futurists believe in. That's why they, they don't believe they reject this whole concept of the soul and spirit and all that kind of stuff. But I think there is something more to it. And I think in the future, maybe we will be able to quantify that there is more to uh, intelligence than just the computation from a very sophisticated computer. Uh, I mean, look, I mean, at this stage, I'll be happy for a future, to be honest. <laughs> things be are going. For a future to be like that? Uh, no, no. At this stage, I'll be, I'll be, I'll, I'll be happy for a future. I, I would be happy for a future because you are. Right, I mean, look, it's, things are looking very, very bleak, and you know, my gosh, I, I try to live my day now basically just trying to make the, the the best of it. All these, look, most of the people who come across me, their their main, I suppose the the main thing they say against me is that, oh, you think too deeply, you know, because, uh, yeah. I, I, That's I, been I, my I, favorite thing about this conversation. We've really gone deep into like a lot of like, uh, maybe some, I, I hope some of the people of you this will appreciate this conversation. Let us know in the comments below, but I think we've really gone deep into some of the even more esoteric philosophical issues, like what it means to be human and alive, like the computational elements, stuff like that. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. But look, you know, it's, it's um, you know, we are who we are, basically. I mean, not, as you alluded to earlier, not everyone has been tasked with the job of uh, seeing what, what others can't see. But, but ultimately, whether you see or not, um, I've come to the, 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 the go-to here is, or if you're going to get any, anything out of this conversation, it is get out of that network onto the other network where it's your soul, your spirit, and you're not subject to, to, to the group thing. I think that's, I mean, for me, yeah. for me, look, I, I doing that research, it, it, I could quite easily have fallen on the conclusion of, mate, it's not even worth looking for love or anything like that. It's just, mm -hmm. we're up against it, but yeah. Hey, I'm an eternal optimist. <laughs> Absolutely. That right there, I'm going to end it there because that's the most beautiful thing to me about the human spirit because there are times in history, and I think there will be in the future, where you see things being so grim, so dark, that the rationalist, someone that has had the, the, the foresight to see what is possible, right? They just think, oh, look, it's impossible. They'll say, what's the point of even trying? You know, like there's no point striving for something better because this is so bleak. But the beauty of the human spirit is that regardless of the circumstances, you can always overcome your adversity. I believe that there's always this pow power within yourself to go against the in impossible and overcome all the, uh, because most of the cynics will always at some point have told you that it's not possible. Look, I've had a look at the data. We've done all these advanced computational models and we've left no stone unturned. And it's just, look, there's no point even trying to fight this thing. You know, slavery is a given. The world's always going to have slaves. You know, this is what this is the arguments you'd hear in the ancient world that slavery was just a part. It was it was part of just the natural order of things. Right. And there's no way trying to uh, circumvent it. Who would have thought, you know, a few hundred years later that now it's generally universally looked out as being a bad thing. And I think there's always the possibility. There's always the optimistic approach. And that comes from call it what you will, but having that, um, that soul, that um, creative force, you know, God working through you. So um, that's how I feel anyway. And brother, I, I know you have that, that spirit as, as dark as things get. And as much as we talk about a lot of the ominous stuff, you know, we both believe that this fight is worth fighting. And it, it, that's uh, right. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Well, Jamuthi, <laughs> once again, I'm going to uh, wind this thing down. <laughs> We've gone on for another, it's been over two hours now, but it definitely has been um, the most enjoyable conversation I've had in a long time. And thank you for coming on the podcast, brother. And uh, yeah, I'll put your links below. People want to check out Planned Illusion podcast, highly recommend. 
uh, checking this out. If you want to get an insight into some deeper conversations about what's going on in every facet of this planet. Until next time, Jamifi, God bless. And you too, brother. I look forward to speaking to you offline, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let me just end this thing and I'll, uh, I'll be with you in one second, brother. I'm just going to wind this thing down here. Eh, eh, eh. You won't work it, don't get the rest, you won't make it. I don't even care. There's only.